Thank you, Professor David Fitzpatrick, Professor of Modern History at Trinity, for joining us today. You're an expert on a range of themes from the late 18th century to the 20th century and many of the themes that we're discussing on this course, uh, the whole idea of rebellions and the whole idea of how these rebellions are remembered. And in Ireland, we're in a decade of commemorations. Uh, what are your thoughts on that decade of commemorations? I think uh, the coming decade is going to be quite a, bit, quite a challenge, both to historians and the general public, to come to terms with the events of 100 years ago and in a way which will draw um, the community together rather than divide them. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, first of all, the focus of commemoration will be a number of failures, uh, campaigns which failed in terms of the declared intentions of those responsible. For example, the general strike of 1913 was a failure in the sense that the union responsible for it collapsed temporarily, the strike crumbled, uh, and the employers prevailed, at least in the short term. The Great War uh, of 1914 onwards was also a failure in terms of the widely held objective and hope that this would be the war to end wars. The 1916 Rising was uh, a failure in that it uh, brought no military benefits, it brought immense carnage and disruption, although it, some would argue it was uh, a success in the longer term. Come back to that. Uh, the so-called revolution of 1919 to 21 and on uh, also failed conspicuously to achieve the aims of its leaders, to create a united Ireland, uh, which would also be a republic, an independent republic. So failure is a difficult thing to commemorate in a satisfying way. Uh, and then there's a further problem that all of the objectives uh, of the leaders of these movements and, uh, and, and events um, were contested. There is great disagreement about the justification for those who engaged in war, rebellion, revolution or strike action. Uh, and so it is a, an extremely difficult matter to induce, to find a form of commemoration which will bring people together uh, rather than push them further apart. My own feeling is that it will have to be done, if it is achieved at all, uh, through celebrating the solidarity which was shown by different groups uh, rather than their objectives, which will remain contentious, uh, and also to try to be even-handed when dealing with the repercussions and consequences for ordinary people who lived through this era. We have to remember all of those who suffered uh, and um, either uh, as a direct result of revolutionary actions and war or an indirect result. And we, ha we have to find a balanced format which will minimise the offence caused to different parts of Irish society. When we look at one of those events, the 1913 lockout, the, the general strike, do you think that we have a very simplified view of what happened there? Because a lot of the sympathy seems to be with the workers and with Jim Larkin, and there doesn't seem to be any sympathy for the other side. No, I think this it, it, Labour's action in 1913 has been seen as a welcome respite from the endless battle of nationalist and unionist, Protestant and Catholic. Uh, a, a, a perhaps failed opportunity to achieve a non-sectarian movement which would emancipate the working class and uh, bring about a more egalitarian society. So in that sense many, though not all, would regard this as a progressive movement. Uh, but it was much more than, than that. Uh, it was in part, of course, a challenge of working class leaders against employers and business. Uh, it was also a challenge uh, on the part of syndicalists and socialists who were central to the organisation of the strike movement and to the Irish Transport and General Workers Union to, um, uh, to confront the power of the Catholic Church. And not only the institutional church but the Catholic middle class uh, which had gained such wealth and power in the decades leading up to 1913. So it is uh, the Catholic and predominantly nationalist middle class which is under assault, epitomised by William Martin Murphy, the uh, leader of the more than 400 employers who combined together in a non-sectarian combination against uh, the union movement. Um, 
So I, I, I think all of these, these bring in contentious matters, uh, despite the aspirations to avoid sectarian divisions. Uh, uh, this was an event which aroused extraordinary passions, particularly concerning the uh, attempt to send over the children of strikers uh, to Britain, to Wales in particular, to be looked after very often in communist or socialist households, uh, which was um, uh, very strenuously opposed by the Catholic hierarchy and the ancient order of Hibernians. Okay, moving on then to, I suppose, the, the, the events of the following year, the outbreak of the First World War. Uh, so many Irish fought in that, so many Irish died in that, and yet for so many years in Ireland, that was kind of written out of the history. This was undoubtedly the largest deployment of Irishmen, and to some extent Irish women, uh, in any war, certainly since the rebellion of 1798, um, if that can be counted as a war. And uh, it involved uh, probably 210,000 or so Irishmen who either fought in the war because they were already in the services or were reservists, or in about 140,000 cases, people who volunteered. And remember, there was never conscription in Ireland, so every person who decided to volunteer was making their own decision. Um, now, why they made that decision is much debated. And I think, undoubtedly, patriotism and a sense of duty was central to almost every individual decision. But which patriotism? For many, the patriotism meant uh, a duty to Ireland. So John Redmond regarded fighting for Britain and her allies against the so-called Huns uh, as the duty of every good Irishman to fight along with their French brothers. Uh, for most Protestants and most Northerners, um, fighting in the war was the duty of a British citizen. Um, so th that, however, is although very few could have sustained themselves through the horrors of war without a sense that they were performing their patriotic duty one way or another, uh, that does not alone explain why so many joined up. And what they were doing was irrational. It's absolutely crazy to join an army in a time of war. It's very sensible for a poor or unemployed person to join it in peacetime because it provides some sort of shelter, um, some money, a, a good deal of fraternity of a rough kind, and uh, satisfies the sense of adventure and the desire for foreign travel. And that doesn't make much sense if you think of the conditions which were well known to all those who joined up from late 1914 onwards in France or Flanders and beyond, or in Gallipoli. So any rational person who would never have decided it was economically sensible to join the forces during the Great War. And to explain why they did so, one must therefore go beyond the sense of duty or cost-benefit analysis and look to their peers, to the fraternal groups, the, the school groups and friendship circles to which people belonged. And it was these intimate influences, I think, which propelled so many Irishmen, more Catholics than Protestants, all told, uh, to join the forces, um, uh, and which gave momentum to those feelings of patriotism that I've discussed. And why, were, why, were, why was their sacrifice then written out of Irish history for so long? Uh, well, it was never forgotten. I mean, amnesia is a very bad term, which I think is going out of vogue now. Aphasia, perhaps, is a better one, not being able to talk about it. Um, and in public, there was a long period from probably the late 1920s up to the 1970s, when in Southern Ireland, it was extremely difficult to find any public form of commemoration. Private commemoration of the Great War had never ceased. The memory of service within families remained, uh, although it may have faded somewhat, uh, inevitably over time. But in the public sphere, um, increasingly, unfortunately, uh, it became the prerogative of Unionists and Northern Unionists in particular uh, to have organized in public cele celebrations or commemorations of the war and particularly the Battle of the Somme. Uh, and comparable commemorations of Gallipoli and other episodes in the South fell out of use. So what had begun as an ecumenical North-South Catholic Protestant commemoration in the early 20s, through the circumstances of the revolution and all the pain and acrimony aroused by partition, became a politicized commemoration. 
And in the South, although public commemorations did occur, they were organized by what became the, uh, the British Legion, the Royal British Legion eventually, uh, and were seen as something apart from uh, the official world, even though there was some minimal involvement of the state in these commemorations. And I think in recent years, and this is a very good thing in many ways, it has become politically attractive uh, once again to try to find an ecumenical commemoration of the war which will incorporate all of these traditions, North, South, Catholic, Protestant, uh, not merely because that's a good thing in itself, but because it's seen as an essential and effective way of pursuing the peace process in Northern Ireland. And but for, but for the catastrophe there, I do not believe that this would have occurred. Very good. And then moving on to the 1916 Rising. Uh, for some people in Ireland, maybe for many people in Ireland, that is seen as, as the birth of, of the modern Irish state, uh, the, the moment that inspired uh, the, the War of Independence then. Uh, is, do you see it as such a central event in modern Irish history? Well, I think in retrospect, it's undoubtedly a central and seminal event in the same way that, that all strands of labor in later years would look back to 1913 as the first great expression of working class solidarity, even though it failed in its ostensible objectives. So almost all strands of republicanism and broader movement for self-determination looked back to 1916 as their first great demonstration, whether it was Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael or, or indeed Connolly Labour, all saw 1916 as the clean, almost the holy moment uh, in which uh, a pure nationalist movement, unsullied by corruption uh, or uh, in, uh, unattractive motives, um, did something heroic. And that is certainly how it has been widely regarded, although there are increasingly dissentient voices who feel the heroism, the uh, chivalry um, of the participants has been overplayed. Um, now, from a historian's point of view, though, one tends to look back to the what it meant at the time. And it's necessary to remind ourselves that uh, it had very few supporters and that even among those who in principle supported the idea of a republic, which was a tiny minority of nationalists in April 1916, most of them were duped into fighting uh, through manipulations of their leaders. Now, I don't want to say their leaders were crooks, what I want to say is that they were conscious of the fact they did not have public opinion behind them uh, and were also driven to a frenzy of frustration by the disappointment of their hopes. And their central hope from August 1914 onwards had been that the outbreak of war, Britain's involvement in a war, would be Ireland's opportunity, harking back to an old cliche of uh, Irish nationalism. Uh, and it hadn't happened. Instead of the nationalist public being alienated from Britain, it appeared to the, certainly to contemporaries, that the connection was closer than ever before in 1914-16. So these frustrated leaders who were looking for a more radical solution than home rule, uh, who felt that that would never bring something close to their dream of a republic, they are driven into the desperate measure of deliberately moving into uh, a rising that most of them believed they could not win in the hope, which turned out to be largely justified, that it would bring about um, a revulsion against British rule and a radicalization of nationalism. And in this they were greatly hope, helped by the overreaction and the, uh, the arbitrarily extended coercion which was applied under martial law. When you have thousands of people arrested who had nothing whatever to do with the rising simply because they had been involved in radical nationalism. And when you had people like Patrick Pierce's brother being executed when they had no motive role in the rebellion. You mentioned earlier the so-called revolution of 1919 to 1921. Why is it a so-called revolution? Well, I think it's, I, I, I so-called it, uh, or I, I <laughs> referred to this notion, because if you look at it retrospectively, uh, so little seemed to change that it uh, could scarcely be regarded as a revolution by most criteria, um, except in the sense of uh, a wheel turning round. And um, certainly in social terms, the, Im at least the immediate impact on Irish society was very small. Uh, uh, in political terms, 
the effect was to create um, partition, two Irish states, neither of which was a republic, one of which was um, a home rule entity within the United Kingdom, that is Northern Ireland, and the other one an Irish free state with powers somewhat greater than would have been gained under home rule, but somewhat less than those of the so-called white, again, so-called white dominions uh, of Australia, New Zealand and Canada. So what sort of a revolution was it? And here again, when one has to go back to the experience of the time. How did participants view this? And um, from my own interviewing in the past of veterans, they certainly felt that they had lived through a revolution. They had lived through a transformation. And to point out that many of their hopes were disappointed and that uh, old ways and structures were soon restored uh, had no effect because for these people, most of them young men or women, uh, at a time of high excitement, late teens or twenties, this was a, a liberation. Through revolution they were liberated, able to do things and hope for things, even if they didn't achieve them, which they could never have dreamt of in normal times. So in that sense this was a revolution, but it was a revolution for the individual, a transformation which would always be remembered as a, a unique moment in otherwise humdrum lives. You mentioned that it's hard to commemorate things that ended in failure, and you saw the lockout in 1916 and even the War of Independence, but isn't it the case that almost everything in this course ends in failure? Legislative independence, the 1798 rebellion, Emmett's rebellion, Young Ireland, the Fenians, uh, the famine is the great disaster of the 19th century. Uh, in a way, the entire course of Irish history in this period is a story of failure. Yes, or perhaps the course of all political history, of all history, is a story of failure. The, the story of every human life ends in death. Um, but it, 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 nevertheless, perhaps it's an accentuated case of this problem characterises the island of the period we're talking about. Uh, uh, one shouldn't overdo it because things aren't as bad as they might have been. Uh, more was achieved than many predicted. And at the time, this liberating effect on the imagination, which I was talking about, and which also applied to Ulster Unionists involved in the Great Covenant uh, movement of 1912 and onwards, these things did create an excitement and a feeling of communal solidarity to which anybody can look back with envy uh, in the increasingly disaggregated, fragmented society in which we live, not just in Ireland, but worldwide, at the very moment that we think we're getting more and more integrated in a global society. Uh, are we not becoming more fragmented as individuals, more desperate to find others out in the ether with whom we may communicate meaningfully? And I think there are many uh, who have looked back on the events we've been talking about as moments when this communal intensity was achieved, when something more than just uh, the, the, the um, greedy motives of people trying to claw out an existence in a hostile world was exhibited, some stronger moral impulse. Professor David Fitzpatrick, lots to think about there. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much.